blessing me. I said he's blessing me. He's blessing you. He's blessing me. He's blessing me. Come on, put your hands together. If you know the Lord has been good to you, if you know he's made ways out of no way, if he's opened doors, come on, can I get a witness? He's blessing me. Yes, he's blessing me. He's blessing me. He's blessing me. He's opening doors. He's made ways out of no way. He turned my life around. He turned my midnights into day. He's blessing me. He's blessing me. He's blessing me. He's blessing me. He's B L E S S I N G. Blessing me. He's B L E S S I N G. I N G. Can I get an I-N-G? 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 You and me? I-N-G? You and me? Blessing me! Blessing me! Blessing me! Oh, blessing me! Blessing me! Oh! Every time I turn around, I wonder if that's anybody's testimony this morning. Every time I turn around, he just keeps on blessing me. I-N-G. Not just in the past, but a continuation of his blessings in my life. Give God a big hand clap of praise in this house this morning. Good to see those of you who are present. We praise God for those who are live streaming. Join me in a word of prayer, if you will. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, for this day that you've granted us through your Son, your Savior, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. We thank you, God, that you've enabled us to be here to this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth, to seek, God, your face, and to hear from your word. We thank you, God, for the worship experience, and we trust and pray, God, thus far it has been pleasing in your sight. Speak now, God, and let your word go forth. Let it resonate with the hearer. May it find a resting place in the mind and the heart of those who are present and those who are here, and we'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and the glory. We ask God for the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We praise God for those who are here again. Just turn with me to John, the 10th chapter. Going back to a very familiar passage of Scripture, John 9, 10, 9 and 10. John, the 10th chapter, the Gospel of John. Speaking about the Good Shepherd. Amen. Jesus says in verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. We want to talk about faith and the abundant life in Christ. Faith and the abundant life in Christ. Everything centers and hinges on our faith in Christ. I was watching a documentary on last week pertaining to churches in America. And the narrative narrator was speaking of how so many churches have turned him off 
And as a result, he no longer attends any particular congregation. And as I ponder over that, I came to the realization that many people's faith have been shipwrecked and destroyed because of the false prophets and false teachers who were dressed in religious attire and who posed and presented themselves as servants of Christ, but were merely wolves in sheep clothing. Not only this country, but across this globe, multiple lives and souls have been doomed and destroyed by those who have taken advantage of the weak and deceived those who are sincerely searching and looking for truth in the life of Jesus that comes only by relationship with him. And one of the reasons so many souls are so easily deceived is because the deceivers are good at taking God's word and misinterpreting it so that the purpose is to exploit those who hear them. When Jesus says the thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy in this text, he was not necessarily referring to the devil, but to those who operate under the devil's influence and those who are led by his deceitful tactics. In fact, he was talking about religious leaders and those of the Jewish nation that had exploited his people and had taken advantage of those who were sincerely seeking to be saved. But the Bible, my brothers and sisters, clearly conveys in verse 9 how faith and the abundant life in Christ is accomplished, and that is, it's not by chance, but it's by choice. Jesus says right here in verse 9, I am the door, and if any person enters, he or she will be saved. And that person will go in and out and receive and find pastor. And so the choice is in the word if. Notice, if you will, my brothers and sisters, in verse 9, when he says, I am the door. In other words, there's not another door. There's no other way to get into the kingdom of heaven but by Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so he does not say, I am one of the doors. He does not say, I am just a door. He says, I am the door. I am the only door that opens your eternity to a life of bliss before the God of creation. And he says right there that if any person, the word if, if any person, doesn't matter who you are, what your race or nationality is, doesn't matter what you've done, he says if any person comes through that door, this one particular door, it says you shall be saved. Now watch this, when we choose to come into Christ, that is to say, my brothers and sisters, we don't just come to know him by way of a surface relationship, but we come to know him. He says if any person comes in, that is if we come into him and he comes into us, then this chemistry and this oneness is developed as a result of the relationship that God has forever intended for him and his creation. In fact, the Bible tells us in John the 17th chapter in Jesus' priestly prayer that it's God's desire for all of us to be one with him. In fact, in the John the 15th chapter, he says on a numerous occasions, at least 11 to 14 times, that if any person abides in me, that is if you come into me and if you remain in me, not wavering, not vacillating, not one day with me and three months without me, but if you stay there, he says the, the guarantee is that when you come into me, not only will you be saved, but you'll find great pastor. That is to say, my brothers and sisters, the first promise is that he promises that you will literally be saved. The word saved in this text comes from a Greek word, sozo, which means sozo, which is the totality of our salvation. It's not just leaving earth, going to heaven. It's not just the guarantee that one day when this life is over, when we fly away, we'll be at rest. But he's saying in essence that you will be saved not only eternally, but you will also find salvation here on earth. Because the word speaks of salvation in its totality. That is to say that as we get saved, the abundant life guarantees that if you walk by him, if you enter into him, 
You do not have to experience the same kind of life you lived before you got saved. He says, I didn't just come to give you life. I came to give you life and then life more abundantly. That is, I came to give you everything that I am. I came to give you all of me. I came to give you heaven on earth. Now, now watch this. He talks about three things and I'm going to be done. First of all, he talks about faith in God's divine promise for eternal life. He says, I am the door. There's no other way to come in. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, and I've talked to numerous people, my brothers and sisters, who have come to the conclusion that God can't save them because they've done too much evil. But I want to help somebody today. It doesn't matter how much evil you've done. Jesus says, I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the sinner. I didn't come for folk that had it together. I came for folk who didn't know how to get it together. And Satan has blinded so many people to come to the conclusion that they cannot be right with God because they've done so much wrong. But I want to help you this morning. He says, whoever, God so loved us. In fact, the Bible tells us in Romans, the fifth chapter, God in the sixth chapter, he didn't, he didn't love us when we were right. He loved us because we were wrong. In fact, when you read John 3.16, God so loved the world, the word S-O in that text uh, 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 literally considers that God so loved us to the point he knew we didn't deserve it, but he so loved us anyhow. He knew we should have been destroyed, but he so loved us. He knew hell should have been our home, but he so loved us that, that instead of destroying us, he sent his only son into the world so that we wouldn't have to die like that. And then he said, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter who you did it with. It doesn't matter how long it lasted. When you enter into this door, you shall, S-H-A-L-L, be saved. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to know that my past sins and my present sins have been covered by the blood. And not only my past and my present, but when I sin in the future, in the name of Jesus, if I just call on that name, I've come to the realization there's healing in that name. There's salvation in that name. There's deliverance in that name. And all you got to do is ask, and God will save you. The word saved does not just mean going to heaven, it means delivered. To mean literally to be delivered from everything. But the first thing he deals with is faith in his divine promise to save you. In Romans 10 and 9 it says that if we will confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God raised Christ from the dead, he said you shall be saved. You got to come to the realization you're not saved by your works. You're not saved by being good. Yes, you strive for it, but that won't get you into heaven. You got to come only through and in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the only door. You don't get saved because you're a Baptist. You don't get saved because you're Presbyterian. You don't get saved because you're Pentecostal. You don't get saved because you're word of faith. You don't get saved because you can speak in tongues. You don't get saved because of all of these other things. You only get saved in the name of Jesus. I think it's in Acts 4 and 12, it says there's no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved but in the name of Jesus Christ. And so many people are religiously connected to the body but unreligiously connected to Christ because they've put their faith in men. You remember in 1 uh, Corinthians, I think it's in the first chapter, Paul talks about how some people were boasting about the fact that they're connected to certain prophets. You know, I know I'm saved because I'm a part of Peter's congregation. Somebody said, no, I know I'm saved because I'm a part of Apollos' congregation. Somebody else says, I know I'm saved because I belong to Paul's congregation. Paul came along and said, all oh, y'all lost if that's the case, because ain't none of us got the power to save you. Ain't nobody got the power but Jesus. And don't, and don't, don't get it twisted. We live in a day and age when a lot of people are based their salvation on what congregation 
they attend. They believe the bigger it is, the more they're saved. But I start about to tell you, size doesn't make you saved. Faith in Christ is what saves you. He says, if anyone will confess with their mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart. And the word believing in your heart is not just saying, I believe in Christ. It means committing yourself to what you say you believe in. If you believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead because everything hinges on the resurrection. Because had he just been born, we wouldn't be saved. Had he just died, we wouldn't be saved. It's the resurrection that seals our salvation. Because it's through the resurrection that the sting of death was taken away. That's why the Bible says for those of us who are in Christ, we don't die, we go to sleep. Because there's going to be awakening day when the dead in Christ will rise. And all those who are alive will be caught up together and meet him in the air where we'll forever be with him some glad morning. And so he says you got to believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead. He says if any person believes that, it's not about how much you give. Yes, you should give all you should. But all these tactics that people have used to lure people to make them think, if you do this, if you do that, if you do this, you'll be saved. Now, what gets you saved is you, if you believe. If you believe. Because I'm on the persuasion, if you believe, you'll give your tithes. If you believe, you'll, you'll submit yourself to the Lordship of Christ. If you believe, you will commit yourself to the services of the body of Christ. If you believe, you will join a local congregation where you can grow. But if you don't believe, he says faith in God's divine promise for eternal life. Look at Romans 10, 13. Because he says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What about the drug addict? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What about that person that was promiscuous in their lifestyle? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What about that person that slipped up and messed up, but then they called upon the name? Whosoever shall call. I wonder if I got two or three folk in the house that's learned how to call on his name when you come short of his God. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul talks about that in Romans, the 10th chapter. He says, how shall they call upon him in whom they have not heard? And how can they, or how, whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? Somebody's got to share the gospel and tell your testimony that what God did for you, he can do for somebody else. I say it all the time, don't be afraid to let people know where you've been. Because wherever you've been, somebody's there right now. And they need to hear a word from somebody who's experiencing what they're experiencing right now to uh, remind them and to encourage them and to let them know if God can deliver me, he can deliver you. That's one of the reasons I've always been so transparent because I never know who's in the congregation. I never know who I'm talking to. But I've come to the realization as people depart the door, many people have said, Pastor, you were talking to me. I was in that situation. And I didn't know that God could deliver. But when you told your testimony, let somebody know where you've been. Let somebody know your story so God can get his glory. Let somebody know that God's still able to save. God's still able to deliver. And so in this text, he says, whoever comes... Whoever enters into this door, he says, if you come into this door, then notice what he says in verse 9. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will or she will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Now, why, what is the pasture he's talking about? He says, what happens is you will find that fellowship among saints and you will be provided for in various ways. So he says, faith in God's divine promise for eternal life, but then notice the abundant life comes solely through our faith in Jesus Christ, and that is faith in God's divine protection in life. That is to say, God not only guarantees through our salvation that you and I will go to heaven, but he promises to protect us on this side of heaven. Y'all should have got excited on that. I don't know about you, but, but, but I just believe that that protection of God, knowing that when you wake up in the morning, God is already, before you got your first blink in, the blink of an eye, he's already dispatched an angel over you. When you wake up in the morning, 
just knowing that goodness and mercy is already waiting on you to get up out of your bed. And God is saying, I got you covered. And it doesn't matter what you experience through the day. It's not an exemption from troubles. It just says, I'm going to protect you through everything you go through. Because if the devil had his way, he would take you out. If the devil had his way, he would make you loose, useless to the kingdom of God. But he says, I'm going to protect you. In other words, every pit hole that the enemy sets, I'm going to navigate you around it. Every plot, every plan that the devil has devised to destroy you and your family, I'm going to make sure that I protect you around it. Every person on your job that intends to cause you to lose your job because they just don't like you or because they hate you or because they're racist or whatever, he says, I will protect you. And they're trying to demote you, but I'm going to promote you. So many of us have experienced God's divine protection and did not realize it. I remember several years ago when I was working manual labor, one of the guys that I rode with, I, I shared with you before, he went behind my back. I was the supervisor over the department. And he went behind my back and, and persuaded the owner of the company that he could do a better job than me. We rode together to work. We were friends. Talked together, ate lunch together. But he went behind my back and persuaded the owner. And I came in one Monday morning, headed to my supervisory position, and the owner called me into his office. He said, Kevin, I need to talk to you. And he told me that now so-and-so is your boss. And I said, what? <laughs> you fill in the blank. I said, what? <laughs> This is in the early 80s. All right. <laughs> I said, I said well, wait, hold up. And I began to talk to him. And he said, no. He said, I believe he can do a better job. And I said to him, I said, you know what? I said, you're making a terrible mistake. I said, but no, I'm not going to argue. I said, here's what I'll do. When you call me back, you're going to have to give me some more money. <laughs> you ain't got to be afraid of the devil. You got to learn how to be face to face and talk to him. And I told him that and it took about two months before he realized that all that metal that was being stacked up against the wall, I used to be in production. You, we used to make all the like the, the doorknobs and everything for every school and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, it was just being piled up against the walls and, and his pride, it was, so, it was so thick that he came up and tried to help the owner of the company. He tried to help fix it himself. And he come up there for days trying to get things back together. But then after about two months, he called me back into his office. He said, Kevin, I'm gonna promote you back to your position with a raise. I stopped by to tell you, God will protect you. You ain't got to fight your own battle. You ain't got to act ugly. You ain't got to cuss nobody out. All you got to do is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him. Won't he do it? He'll navigate your path. And I was so sad by my friend because after, I did, after he did it, I knew what he had done. And when I went back to the uh, line, I went up there and I told him, I said, man, I can't believe you did it. He said, what happened? And I said, you know what you did. <laughs> but here's what happened. Not only did I get promoted, sadly, he got fired. God has a way. I was reading the book of Esther on yesterday. And some of y'all read the story of Haman. How sometimes people who exalt themselves or get exalted in life, they think they're bigger than they are. And as a result, they choose to overrule God's people in a negative way. And Haman didn't like Mordecai because Mordecai wouldn't bow down. And I won't suggest y'all not bow down to anybody but God. But Haman got upset. And as a result, he had these gallows built to hang him on. But if you read the story, the Bible says that the same gallows he built for, uh, for Mordecai, he got hung on himself. I just want to help somebody. God will protect you. You ain't got to, like I said, you ain't got to fight your own battles. All you got to do is turn it over unto the Lord. I wish I had two or three folk in the house that's tried him and know that God's protection is better and it never fails. Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That is the implication is weapons are formed against you. The enemy will come against you. People will rise up against you. He says, but they will not prosper. And every tongue, because people will falsely accuse you, every tongue that rises against you, 
in the judgment will be condemned. That's your protection. In Psalm 23 and 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley. Life is dark sometimes. Yea, though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death. He says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God's rod and his staff, they protect me. When Jesus uses this illustration of a shepherd and a sheep, he's talking about how the shepherd watches over the sheep and there's a sheepfold that is built for the protection of the sheep. In other words, it's a sheepfold that keeps the sheep in, but it keeps the wolves out. And the rod and the staff that, that the Bible talks about in Psalms uh, 23 and 4, many have suggested that the rod was that, was that rod that would pull the sheep back into the sheepfold when it begins to wander, but the staff was to beat the enemy on the head. And I stop by to tell you, when the devil comes into your house, you ain't got to raise your own fist. There's a rod and a staff that the shepherd carries. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside the still water. He restores my soul. He, not mama, not daddy. Anybody got a shepherd today? Not just a shepherd, but a good shepherd who watches over you, who protects you, who provides for you. In Psalm 91 and 1, it says, those that abide under the shadow of his wing, it gives illustration that God will keep you. That is to say the enemy comes against you. But to get to you, they got to go, go through God. I was also reading Job the other day, and I thought about how God allowed the enemy to attack Job's house. But he put limitations. And even with the limitations, while the enemy was able to come against him and to cause him to lose everything he had and cause him to be sick for a while, the Bible says that God still put limitations and says, don't touch his soul. That's divine protection. Why? Because Satan is not satisfied with you being sick. He's not satisfied with you being broke. He wants you dead. And what God will do, he'll allow the enemy to attack you for the sole purpose of getting glory out of what you go through. Because I'll stop out and tell you, when you go down, he will raise you again. He will, he will elevate you to the place. And not only will he elevate you to that place, it usually takes you higher than where you've been. If Joseph was here in Genesis 37, he would tell you, I went to the pit, I went, I went to the prison, but eventually I got to the palace. And I became, and they took my colorful coat, but it wasn't compared to the robe that I received when I became the prince of Egypt. Don't worry about what you lost, just start thinking about what God's gonna give you to gain in life. Faith in God's divine promise for eternal life, faith in God's divine protection for this life, and then finally, Faith in God's divine power to overcome life. One of the things that Jesus suggests here when he says, I'm the door, if anyone enters in by me, he will be saved eternally. He will go in and out and find pasture. That is, you will be provided for. You will be protected. He says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that those who come into me may have life and that they may have in life more abundantly. Now watch this, when we choose to come into Christ, that is to say by faith, what happens is the abundant life is packaged with the guarantee that every saint who will trust and obey God will possess the power to overcome whatever you face in life. One of the things I said earlier is that a lot of people, when they teach about faith, they teach faith from the perspective that if you just trust God, you won't go through anything. But if you didn't go through anything, you wouldn't need any faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, which means the reason you need faith is because you're hoping for something you can't really see. When you're bound by something, you're going through some kind of trial, test, or trouble, you can't always see yourself out of it clearly. And so your faith registers with Christ and believes by faith that whatever God has allowed, God will bring me through it. And so, and so he says in here that, that he says that the thief comes to steal, but I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, which says not only will you have to experience certain things in life, but you have the ability to overcome any and everything that rises up against you. You can overcome any and everything that rises up against your family. You can overcome any and everything that rises up in your mind. Why? Because the Bible says you are an overcomer. 
Romans 8, 37 says, Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. In 1 John 5 and 4, he says this is the, vic this is the faith that we have, and, and the victory is in our faith. In fact, I want to turn there if you can. Go to 1 John 5 and 4. Let's just kind of read that because we want to walk in that one. He says in 1 John 5 and 4 that we have the ability to overcome everything by faith. Watch this. He says, you got it? For whoever is born of God, the question is, are you really saved? Are you in him or just in the house of God? Because he says, whoever's been born again, he specifies that if you've been born again, he says, whoever, doesn't matter, man, woman, boy, girl, whoever is born of God does what? Overcomes the world. In other words, when the world comes against you, it does not matter how big your problem is. It doesn't matter what giant comes up in your life. He says if you're born again, you overcome the world. You overcome every sickness. You overcome every pain. You overcome every trouble. You overcome every person that rises against you. You overcome the world. Great is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In fact, I think it's in Psalm 27 when David writes, he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He says, even when the wicked, my enemies, and my foes rose up against me, they stumbled and fell. He said, though an host should encamp against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord. In other words, I don't have to lose my confidence because of what's going on around me. God didn't call you to a life of depression. God didn't call you to a life of anxiety. God didn't call you to a life of being worried and troubled about what's troubling you. He says, overcome that stuff. Why? Because when you come into me, I've, oh, I've given you the power to overcome anything. And how many know that I was somebody on Wednesday night? How many of them know that naturally the first thing we do when we go through something is complain about it? We start whining about what we're going through. And I want to suggest again, quit whining and start worshiping. Start talking about the God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask, think, or imagine. So start talking about the God who spoke nothing and spoke nothing into something when he says, let there be, and it was. Talk about, talk about that God who's able to take nothing and call it into something. Romans 4, 17, it says he's able to take nothing and literally call it. He could take your situation and turn that thing all around. He can make your unhappiness happiness. He can take your sadness and turn it into joy. He can take your confusion and turn it into to peace. You got to learn to turn it over, overcome that stuff. Don't waste another day sad by what you go through. I was talking to somebody not too long ago, and it, it really saddens my heart that so many Christians, so many professed Christians, don't know how to live life according to the abundance that God has given them. It's not just talking about money. Money is good, but money perishes. Not just talking about material things. Material things are good, but they don't make you happy always. In fact, I was talking to somebody not too long ago, and I was commending them on their new vehicle. I said, man, that thing is nice. He said, yeah, I love it, except for once a month. <laughs> All that stuff that makes us feel good, it can also make us cry. But, but, but I, but I want to help somebody by, by letting you know you can overcome everything. Satan will rise up in your family, but you can overcome it. Satan will rise up against you, but you can overcome him. People will come against you, but you can overcome them. You don't have to be like them. I always say, don't ever reduce yourself to the level of the person you despise. If you don't like what they're doing, don't become like them. You don't act like them. You supersede because you got a superpower within you. When Jesus came into this world, when he died on that cross, when he was buried in our place, when he rose on our behalf, he didn't just do that just to be doing it. He said, in fact, he said in Matthew 28, 19, he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, which means he transitioned the power from himself to his disciples. You and I got the, the power to live life free from worry. We got the power to live life free from depression. We got the power to live life free from anything that bothers us. Yes, it'll come against us, but it doesn't have to overcome us. Why? Because we overcome it. Yeah. And by our overcoming it, 
other people who see us are encouraged as a result of what they see God do in our lives. I'm going to close with this. Remember the Apostle Paul. Paul said that he said many people while he was incarcerated for preaching the gospel didn't commit a crime, but they locked him up. He said, but other saints, when they saw how he hounded up his incarceration and when he continually to preach behind bars, he says other saints were encouraged when they saw how he handled his trials. And I want to suggest your children will be encouraged in the faith of Jesus Christ if you conduct yourself wisely when the enemy rises up against you. Because they learn by observation. People in the body of Christ learn by observation. And so we don't just want to tell them what to do, we want to show them how to do it. And that's why I try to make sure that I never allow myself to find myself in a state of depression where I complain, yes, I'm human. But I thank God that there's somebody superhuman that lives inside of me. And I heard somebody say, when I take my human and I put it to God's super, all of a sudden we become superhuman, not because of who we are, but because of he who dwells within us. And I want you to leave here today saying that you know you're going to come across some stuff this week that's going to rise up against you, but you don't have to be taken down by it because you are an overcomer. You overcome everything. And that's the word today. God is able to do exceedingly, exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask, think, or imagine through the power that works in you. Don't underestimate your power and don't underestimate your value. You are a powerful person in Christ. And you've got the power to be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to go through anything that life brings and not be taken by it. Why? Because that's faith in the abundant life in Christ Jesus. I'm not saddened by anything. Yes, things rise up. And yes, the temptation to worry is always there. The temptation to fear is always there. The temptation to doubt is always there. But when you remind yourself of to whom you belong, when you remind yourself you are a child of God, God is not just our God, he's our Father. He's our Heavenly Father. He will provide and he will protect. And every fear, every stronghold, every vice, every every kind of bondage that tries to hold you hostage, you can overcome it. And that's why in uh, 2 Corinthians 10, it says pulling down every stronghold. God's not going to do it. He's empowered you to do it. Taking captive every thought that rises itself against the knowledge of God's word, you've got to do that. Christ is not going to do it for you. He's given you the power. So your joy is now in your hands. Your peace is now in your hands. Your happiness is now in your hands. Your ability to succeed in life is now in your hands. Why? Because he's empowered you to be successful in every area of your life. Father, we thank you for your word today. We are so thankful and grateful that the abundant life that Christ came to give us is not just monetary, materialistic gain, but the ability to live life very free. To live life, to have death strike our families and not lose it, but to understand that we can overcome this. To have financial storms to rise against us, but to understand we can overcome it. To have family problems and issues, but to understand that we can overcome them to have problems on our jobs, but to understand we can overcome it. You have made us overcome us. And so God, when we leave here today, let us leave here with the understanding that all that you went through and all that you overcame, you gave us that same power to go through it so that we can also overcome it. Touch somebody's heart today, God. Deliver somebody. Rescue them from themselves. Remove fear and doubt from their hearts and let them trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask as we stand, as we extend an invitation.
Might be somebody here today who's never accepted Christ as his or her personal Lord and Savior. And we want to encourage you to come today. If you've never received him, he says, any person that enters into that door, you enter that door by faith. By confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. If you come into that door, the scripture says you will be saved. But not only will you be saved by his promise, you will be protected as one of those who are in him now. You'll find pastor wherever you go. He'll provide for you. He'll protect you. And he'll give you the ability to overcome everything that you go through in life. That's the abundant life. Yes, on this side, we've got to go through some stuff. On this side, we've got to experience some troubles. But we'll overcome them. It's when we get on the other side that there'll be no more crying. When we get on the other side, there'll be no weeping, no, form, no pain, no troubles. All the former things will be done away with. But on this side, we've got to deal with it. But God says, I'll help you if you trust me. If you just come to me, I'll make it possible. If that's you today, won't you come? If you don't have a church home, want to rededicate your life, why don't you come? Say, God, I surrender my heart, my mind, my soul, my body. I give it all to you. Will you trust him today? If you don't have a church home, want to rededicate your life, to become a part of our church family. Step out by faith. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All to thee. You may be seated. It may be someone who decided to come but did not come. You can also see one of these men and women after service, and they will uh, attend to you. This time we're going to prepare to take up or participate in our communion. And uh, Jesus says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. I thank God for his goodness. I thank God for his grace. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. If you are in him, we encourage you to participate with us. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for this bread that symbolizes the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, for this juice that symbolizes the blood that was shed for the remission of many. Now, God, we pray your anointing upon us, upon this ceremony as we reflect upon what your Son, our Savior, and our Lord went through to secure our salvation. As we reflect upon the scourging, the beatings, the mockery, hanging there on that cross, nailing every sin in the world on it, taking it to the grave and then being raised with a new glorified body, which is our hope. Speak now into our lives as we participate in this. Help it to register and to resonate with our hearts and our minds and understand the severity of what we're doing. I pray, God, that you will forgive us of every sin, every iniquity, every transgression, every evil thought, every right word, every wicked imagination, every wrong deed in our bodies. And bless us now as we unite together as a body in obedience to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ.
Had an opportunity to be served. The Bible says when Jesus was in the upper room, he took the bread, broke it, and blessed it to eat ye all of it. Took the cup, said this blood represents the blood that was shed for the remission of many. Said, drink ye all of it. So they departed singing a hymn. I want to thank God as we depart to our Sunday morning classes, life application class, Sunday school and uh, our new members orientation class, we encourage everyone to go. And also don't, be, uh, don't forget that on this Wednesday, we have our Bible studies. Gonna ask that you will come out and share with us at our noonday and our evening Bible studies. Been having a wonderful time as we study and finish up the book of Ephesians. Also in your bulletin, there is some information about our trip to Israel. And for all of you who desire to uh, be a part of that trip on uh, next year, we're asking that you will contact Sister Jackie Ellis. I'll call the church and let us know. And the information, there's quite a bit of information in there. But we would like for everyone to go as we take a, a church group and a church trip together to the Holy Land. Amen. And so we're encouraging everybody to be a part of that. Also, be mindful that on tomorrow, Lord willing, that we're going to uh, celebrate the home going as a memorial for Brother James Wycliffe, which will take place here at uh, 11 o'clock. At 11 a.m. at First Baptist Church, and then on Friday, we're going to have the homegoing celebration of Brother Beecham's son. Uh, that will also take place here on Friday at 11. The wake is going to be from 9 to 11 on Friday of, of this coming week. Uh, be in prayer for all those who had death in the family. I also think, if I'm not mistaken, Sister Martha Gibbs uh, had death in the family. Did your mom die? Somebody sent the text saying her mom passed away, and so we want to be in prayer for her as well. And uh, continue to pray for my wife's family, who also not only had a 
uh, James Wycliffe, who was also in the family at one point, but also her nephew, a uh, uh, great nephew, was also killed on last week, and they celebrated his home going. There's a lot of things going on, but God is still able. And so we want to thank God, just encourage each other, continue to look out for each other. Also continue to pray for me. I was uh, almost not going to preach this morning. Uh, I told my wife yesterday I was so, I came up with some kind of, I don't know if it's a cold flu, the allergies, I don't know what's going on. But uh, I called somebody at 10 o'clock last night, said I need you to come and preach for me, but they didn't answer the phone. <laughs> so, so I just took some medication and I, so I can still feel it right now, but uh, I pray it's all well. Pray for me that I might be healing, but I'm not going to go out there and shake anybody's hand because I want to make sure that I don't know if it's allergies or COVID, I don't want to pass it on like that, but do pray for us and uh, continue to pray for our families as we uh, continue to go forth. And do know that I'm praying for you. All of you that desire to sign up for our texting uh, uh, system, we encourage you to do so. Uh, if you would like to do so, you can uh, first you can call the church, and Brother Billy will take care of that. Or if they put that on the screen, do you all have it ready to put on the screen? You can sign that up, uh, sign up. And uh, once or twice a week, we try to send out a word of encouragement or to remind you of some of the things that may be going on here at First Baptist Church of Jefferson Town. At this time, we're preparing to take up our offering. And uh, there are five ways of giving. You can give in-house by way of cash. You can give by check, or you can give by way of the kiosk. You can also give online, or you can have it taken directly out of your deposit, or uh, your checking account by way of electronic withdrawal. We encourage everyone to give. Uh, I don't speak a lot about money, but money is a necessity to continue to run uh, an organization and the body of Christ that he's allowed us to be a part of, such as this. Takes a lot of expense, not only for administrative things, but even for those uh, monies that we use to help people, to assist people, to do all the ministries here at First Baptist Church. We do it all through your tithes and your offerings. So I'm going to ask that you would be faithful to God, as you know God has been faithful to you. Give, and it shall be given. Press down, shaking together, running over, shall God cause others to give into your bosom. Amen. Are there any other announcements I may have missed before we close? I need to. All right. Be in prayer for Brother. Pastor McElvaney, as he's uh, taking on the interim pastor at uh, Inn Street Baptist Church. And so uh, he's going to be going there. And, uh, but he's still going to be working. He's still a member of our church. He's still working with us. But he's got it worked out where he's going to be doing that, but still being able to do what God has called him to do here. So we're going to be praying for you and uh, your wife and your family as a whole. Amen. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, for today's worship experience. And we praise you, God, for your goodness toward us. I ask God you bless us as we go forth from this place, but never from your presence. Keep us in your care, and we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I also forgot to mention that this was a part one and part two sermon, so the other part going to be at the next service. All right, God bless you. <laughs> Oh, come on, put your hands together if you know you've been washing the blood. Hallelujah.